Good evening, gentlemen. This is Jerome from the Maximum Intensity Podcast. Maximum Intensity is a way of life. It is grabbing the bull by the horns. It is seizing your life and deciding who you are as a man, what you want your life to be about, and what legacy you ultimately want to leave upon the world and upon your family. It is defining your own happiness. It is becoming an alpha male, a leader of your own life, a leader of your clan, your friends, your family, your tribe, with passion, with pleasure, with joy, with intensity. Life is short. It is brief. It is fleeting. I uh, was a volunteer firefighter for a couple of years for uh, those individuals that don't know and recently um, lost an individual that uh, only went on a couple of calls with, but this uh, young man was only a touch over 50 and uh, essentially had a heart attack that he could not... um, be brought back from, I suppose, for lack of a better word, and uh, left behind a wife, left behind a five-year-old little girl, and his time on this earth is gone. Uh, A quick callback to the first podcast, which was uh, all about mortality. This life is all you have. Whether you're religious or not, you have a fixed amount of time on earth. Your heart only has so many beats. Your Your lungs only draw so many breaths. You only have so many interactions with friends, family, coworkers. You only have so many opportunities to make the most out of life. Our life is brief. Our life is fleeting. And we tacitly assume for far too long in many of our lives that we are going to go through life happy and healthy. And we live too reactionary to the world around us. Too many of us wake up to the alarm clock. We shuffle downstairs, turn on the coffee pot, flip on the news, hear a bunch of things that we don't really hear want to hear about listen to a bunch of things that we don't really want to listen about puts us in a negative state right away right i don't know about you but i don't want to listen to houses burning down i don't want to listen to politicians doing terrible things i don't want to listen to uh, different events that are going on all across the world that uh, aren't too terribly positive that don't directly affect my life and our emotional state is under attack from the moment that we wake up. And if we're not aware of it, if we live too reactionary, uh, it can kind of ruin our whole day. Um, With time being as fleeting, being as brief as it is, it's extremely important to live in the moment. The past is nice. It's in our head. It's in our memory. No one can take that away from us. We'll always have it. The future, however, is not guaranteed. Uh, We presume that it will happen. We suppose that things are going to work out a certain way. And for many of us, uh, that has a very slight, possibly just negligible effect on our choices in the present. But truthfully, all we ever have in life is the present. All we have is the decisions that we can make now. All we have is the thoughts that are in our head, the actions that we can take, the people that we're around, and the choices that we have in front of us. We can plan for the future And it's a good idea to do that, but the future is not guaranteed. You really uh, have to be cognizant and hyper aware of what's going on in the moment and make sure that you are the judge. You are the arbiter of what dictates what's happening in your moment, not the news, not your boss, not uh, some alerts that are going off on your smartphone or some jerk who cuts you off in traffic. No matter what is going on in your life, you get to decide what presently happens in the moment, and what's going to happen in the future. I recently uh, had to mourn the loss of an individual that um, I know through the fire department. And for those who don't know, I was a, a volunteer firefighter for a couple of years, and this particular individual was only about 50 and uh, passed away last week and left behind a, a younger wife and a five-year-old little girl. Um those moments in life, uh, losing somebody is the hardest thing in life. It's just the, it's the worst emotional pain there is because once they're gone, they're gone. But what we need to do to honor their memory is to really live in the present, to make the most out of our lives, out of the choices, out of the opportunities and out of the options that we have available to us at any given moment in time. If this life is all you have, which uh, I believe is um, all the evidence shows, 
you don't want to leave anything on the table, do you? You don't want to leave anything behind. You don't want to leave anything untried. While losing somebody is the worst pain and is probably the worst thing in life, I think regret has got to be the second to worst thing. If you are fortunate enough to be lucid on your deathbed in your late years in late years in life, excuse me, what are you going to regret? And for the people that get interviewed, it's it's not the mistakes they've made. It's not the F-ups that they've had in life. They regret the things they never tried, the choices they have that they never went for, the risks they never took, the never having the guts to really make that connection and reach out and tell that person that you love them, you appreciate them. They regret the things they never went for. They don't regret the mistakes they've made because at least they tried, but... That regret really should be at the forefront of our mindset as we go about making our decisions daily. So today's podcast, Your Happiness is All That Matters, is what I'm going to call it. We're going to talk about how to live uh, proactively with your emotions and with your mindset so that you have more decisions and you have more control over the ultimate direction of your life. Like I said, too many of us live reactionary to the things around us, and to me that is a... um, That is a vapid mental and emotional state. That is not a way that you want to go through life, having other people tell you what to think and how to feel. You are your own man. You are your own woman. You are capable of your own decisions. And only you can define what your happiness is. Only you can define who you are as a man and what you want your life to be about. But I think too many of us uh, go through life without doing that. We have this empty search for happiness. Uh... We get caught up in things, just trying to make it through the day, and then, you know, years pass, months, weeks, years pass and go by, and then we realize that we never put in any work to really accomplish anything that we wanted to do at all that's of any actual meaning or emotional satisfaction in our lives. And instead, we've we've squandered it away on uh, Netflix binges and uh, eating ice cream or whatever it is for you. Uh, Only you can define your happiness and what you want your life to be about. We get caught up in doing things like paying the bills. No, I get it. Like We all have bills that we have to pay, some of us more than others. Uh, And we will do what it takes to pay bills, especially if you're a family man, if you have kids. You know that you're always going to find a way to put food on the table and a roof over their head. But the problem is when we're just trying to get by, when our mindset is we're just trying to survive is we do things that might be a little out of character. We do things that we temporarily put up with um, to take care of these issues, but without any forethought to the long-term consequences of those actions. We take jobs that might pay a little bit better, might have better benefits, but don't necessarily fulfill our emotional happiness. They don't really make our lives what we want to be about. And then we realize after working these jobs for a while, that kind of becomes integrated into our identity Granted, that identity is not chosen at the moment, um, but that's how we see ourselves. An individual, hypothetically, who has a family to provide for, let's just assume a 30-year-old male has a wife and a new kid working a certain job, his wife doesn't work, he will do whatever it takes to put food on the table and a roof over his head for his wife and his daughter. And let's say he works at a grocery store stocking shelves overnight. He will do this, uh, you know, because it's congruent with uh, his identity and his emotions and his uh, emotion stack that I call it. And we'll elaborate that on future podcasts. He will do that in order to pay the bills and to provide for his wife and his family. But after a while, he's starting to realize that he's not really happy doing this. But he starts identifying that job as part of who he is. Um, I am a grocery store worker, he might tell himself. I, I stock shelves. I provide for my family. And the danger to that is by not explicitly stating your happiness and your life's purpose uh, from the onset, you don't actually have a goal that you're working towards. And then if this goes on long enough, you can rationalize away your own happiness. And to me, that's uh, that's extremely sad. Um, people that go through their entire lives thinking, well, you know, I always wanted to do this, but never really had the guts to go for it. But they said, well, you know, I had a family I had to take care of. I had this came up, and then the car broke down, and then the garage door broke, and that costs money. So 
I had to work this job and had to pay the bills and at least I have my wife and my kid. That to me is really sad because again, this life is all you have. You have one go around. What I would like to propose for that hypothetical individual is uh, he knows in his gut that he will always find a way to pay the bills to put food on the table. But that doesn't mean he has to stop reaching for that goal. That doesn't mean that he can't work towards that goal uh, and have to compromise time with his family. Where there's a will, there's a way. And if you're clever enough and you're resourceful enough and uh, you have enough grit and determination, make the right connections with people, learn the right skill set, uh, get by on a little bit less sleep, there's a way to get the job done. And that's a, a very empowering mindset to have and is such a better idea for your own long-term happiness than simply this idea that, well, you know, I I work hard, I, I take care of my family, and I always wanted to do this thing, but I guess it just never really worked out. That, to me, is, is so terribly depressing, and I see that with so many people uh, that I've worked with before, and even some individuals uh, who come to me for personal training or for weight loss advice. Um the issue is emotional, whatever it is that we want in life. Getting back to health and fitness, uh, because this is a health and fitness podcast, um, an individual that wants to get in better shape, wants to lose weight, wants to build muscle, they don't just want a smaller waistline. They don't just want more muscle. They want the emotions that they associate to those particular things. And like we talked about in the last podcast, uh, we are all driven by the carrot and the stick, the pain and pleasure in life. And again, just as a reminder, the pain is a much bigger motivator because it's hardwired into our survival. We will do just about anything to get out of pain if there is enough uh, in our gut, in our nervous system at any given point in time. And we will take much more action in that regard to get out of that pain than we will do to gain pleasure. So if you want anything in life, if you have a goal, if you have something that you know you should be working on, too many of us spend too much time thinking about, boy, it would be nice if I wrote that book, if I became a photographer, if I had six-pack abs, if I built this sculpture, whatever it is for you. We spend too much time thinking about all the positives that we could have once we accomplish that particular task. But what we really need to do is we really need to own into the pain of what's it going to be like if I don't get that done? What's it going to be like five years down the road knowing that I haven't taken one step closer towards that goal. What's it going to be like 20 years down the road? 20 years of having this goal that I've been telling everybody that I want to do, but in my gut, I have to come to the realization with my own heart and be honest with myself and say that I never went for it. Or even worse in life, what happens if you're on your deathbed? 85-year-old man, knowing that now you really are too late because you can't even get out of bed. You might only have a few days left. And you've had to know for the last 50 or 60 years that you've been telling people you always had this dream, but you never had the guts to go for it. You have to use that pain. What regret will you have? What pain will you feel by not going for that thing that you ultimately want in life? Fitness is so grossly misrepresented by most trainers, coaches, uh, most individuals that are into fitness. Uh, don't understand that this is a mental and this is an emotional game. The individual that is able to build significant amounts of muscle or lose a massive amount of weight or really drastically transform his or her physique and maintain that, whether they've realized it or not, they are driven deeply by emotion. And for most of them, it's pain. There was some pain in their life that they had to get out of that they would do anything to change it. And whether they consciously recognize it or not, for many of them, that's what drove them to success. Now, I do uh, also like to say that uh, the gym should be a small part of your life. The gym should not be your life. Unless, ultimately, uh, that's what you want your life to be about. Um, it's up to any individual to define his or her own happiness. Uh, but there's... Uh, I'm, I'm not going to name them. Um... One of the biggest early-name drug-free bodybuilders, 
Uh, this gentleman won the Natural Olympia, one of the biggest drug-tested uh, bodybuilding shows. Um, lived in this niche of drug-free bodybuilding for the longest time and was in his early 50s before he really decided that he always wanted a family but had never you know, taken the appropriate action, never really tried to meet women or at least serious women that would want to settle down and have a family with him. And uh, look, I'm 33 with a with a five year old daughter, and having a having a daughter at this age is one thing. But I couldn't imagine waiting 20 more years, knowing uh, the toll that that long term uh, regular weight training could have on the body. How many guys in the gym game end up with aches, pains, and injuries that take away their energy, take away their mobility, and then trying to raise a kid with that? Now, for the 50 something year old man that hypothetically would have a daughter my age look when my daughter is 18 i'm gonna be let's see that would be uh be 13 years from now i'll be 46 i'll still be i'll still be fairly young i'll still be fairly active but if a 55 year old man has a five-year-old daughter he's gonna be 68 when she graduates high school right so he may or may not be around by the time she's done with college uh Again, I'm not knocking anybody too hard who wants to be a bodybuilder, who wants to uh, make a lot of time in their gym, you know, strongman, uh, any kind of competitive lifter. I'm not knocking those guys because they're able to define their own happiness. I would just ask them, how do you see this factoring into the long-term plan of what you really want with your life? You can't be in the gym forever. (laughs) You can't uh, stay in peak performance or peak conditioning your entire life at some point uh, the aging process just takes over things wear out now you can take certain measures to mitigate a lot of that harm and we'll dive into that when i do future podcasts in regarding the uh, specifics of this evolution of high intensity training theory that i've advocated for so long i i really believe um I've mastered that compared to most in in developing what I call maximum intensity training, but we'll get into that in a future podcast. Any gym going individuals, any fitness enthusiasts, uh, at least a lot of the ones I know and the ones I've dealt with and the ones I see online don't have a lot of uh, prior planning with how they're going to get out of the game or how it's going to factor into the bigger picture of their life. Too many of them go from competition to competition, uh, show to show just trying to make the incremental physiques and living in these short term, you know, six month long brackets without seeing the bigger picture of what they ultimately want their life to be about. But getting a little bit back on track, uh, how do you get ahead of your emotions for the day? What are some things that you can do from the moment you wake up and over the course of your day to put you in a peak emotional state? Again, recognizing that this moment that you have right now, any given moment that you are consciously aware, that is the only moment you have in your life. How can you really make those moments work for you and not be so reactionary to everything that's happening around you? Well, one thing that uh, came from a mentor of mine is uh, I have a whiteboard in my office where I record this podcast in my house, and I have a couple questions written on this board, and I review it every single morning. So a lot of these mornings I get up at 2, sometimes 1.30. Uh, if I feel like sleeping in, I'll sleep until 3 a.m. But I get up, I put my glasses on right next to the bed, and I immediately come to the office, and the f- first thing I uh, do is turn on the light, let my eyes acclimate. And there are a couple questions I have written on this board. And the first one is, what am I happy about? And you need, really need to think about this question. It's not just enough to just superficially, well, I'm happy I have this house. I'm happy I woke up. Uh, Happy my daughter's in a great school. Give it some thought. You know, really try and feel those feelings. What am I happy about? Second question, what am I grateful for? And the third question, what do I love about myself and my life more than yesterday? So why would you ask yourself these three questions right when you wake up? Well, it's simple. Uh, in psychology, there's this idea called classical conditioning. And it was, uh, I don't know if it was coined by Pavlov, but he was certainly the one who popularized it. Uh, Ivan Pavlov uh, took these dogs and he would feed them and then he'd ring a bell. He would feed them and he would ring a bell. He would feed them and he would ring a bell. 
And then to change the experiment, he didn't feed them, but he would ring the bell. And what he found is every time he'd ring the bell is that these dogs would start drooling. They would start salivating because in their nervous system, not even conscious thought, but in their nervous system, they had begun to link the ringing of the bell to feeding or to eating. Well, people are the same way. Classical conditioning, I think, plays a much bigger part in our lives than we tend to think of. Uh, another example that you see happen with uh, with couples especially sometimes is, or it might even happen with coworkers, but let's just say your wife comes home and she's had a bad day at work. And she comes home and she's had a bad day at work. And this keeps on happening, keeps on happening. And then she comes home one day and before she even says anything, you can just assume she's in a bad mood. You know, if uh, this second example happens often enough, uh, what unfortunately happens is husbands can um, start to not look forward to their wives coming home, right? Uh, We are classically conditioned with so many things in life. Again, it's hardwired into our survival, uh, the way that we evolve as living organisms and as a species. Uh, This is something that has helped us survive, these subconscious connections that we're able to make. But if we don't take stock of these, if we don't uh, kind of inventory these once in a while, they kind of dictate the course of action and the course of our emotions across our lives. So what you're doing here is you are classically conditioning yourself to feel good when you wake up in the morning. Can you imagine how great it would be if you're used to getting up at 6 a.m. to be able to get up at 5 a.m. having gone to bed at the same time the night before? and feel happy and feel energetic and feel excited first thing in the morning. So early in the morning, the second you get up, whether it's on a sheet of paper, whether you have a whiteboard, ask yourself, what am I happy about? What am I grateful for? And what do I love about myself? And what do I love about my life more than yesterday? And write these down. Your retention is significantly better when you write things down. It's not just enough to say it out loud. It's not just enough to think about it. Say it out loud and write it down. And then look at it and reflect upon it. And then, what are three things that you absolutely must get done that day? And you can start small with these. These don't have to be any big life-altering events. It could be small things like, uh, I have to do some laundry. I have to change the oil on my car. I have to uh, call my mom because it's been a while just to say hi. Just pick three things. What are three things you have to do? And as you start getting better at this and as it starts becoming a habit, what you'll find is that these three things that uh, you tell yourself that you absolutely must get done that day, you start um, making decisions on things that are going to improve the quality of your life. At some point, you know, that house is clean, the car's oil is changed, and you've gotten all these little things out of the way, and you're actually starting to work on things that uh, you want to do with your life. Uh, Read for 30 minutes. Um, Ask out that cute girl, you know, two cubicles down. Whatever it is for you. Uh, You will find things that will improve the quality of your life simply by picking three things that you must get done that single day. If you want anything in life, uh, I'm going to introduce you guys to an idea that will be an episode for a future podcast. There's a little thing known as the 80-20 rule, and it um, it has a lot of variations, but the basic premise is the same. Uh, when you're in, in grade school, you know, the top 20% of the kids answer 80% of the questions. Your top 20% of the salespeople will generate 80% of your revenue. Uh, The top 20 workers do about 80% of the work. Um, If there's 100 things that you need to get done on a particular task, the top 20 of them will produce the most results. So what you want to do as you're knocking out these three things that you must do every single day is start, uh, start kind of in the back of your head asking yourself, are some of these things that I say I want to do, you know, are they in the top 20? Or are they maybe in the top 80 or so? So if you, uh, let's just say, if you're writing a book, um, some of the things in the top 20 might be fleshing out uh, a certain chapter, deciding how you want a certain story arc to go, really developing a character. Some of the 80% of the things that you need to work on might be, um, getting the proper typography done, making sure you're um, separating chapters the way you're supposed to, getting everything structured the way it needs to be when it finally comes out as a book. 
there are things that are more important or things that are less important. And what you'll find is you're asking, if you're asking yourself, you know, what are three things that you must get done that day? And you write them down and then you do them uh, as soon as you can that day. What you'll find is you will start skewing towards those 20 over a period of time. But if in the back of your head, you're at least uh, superficially aware of the 80-20 rule, you'll start moving that direction a little bit faster. And then some other things for the day. Uh, we all know basically over the course of a day, certain things that are going to happen that day. If we have to go to work, um, you know, we, we know what's going to happen. If we have a phone call with a client, we know what time we have that call and what the conversation is going to be about. So for certain planned activities that you have for that day, ask yourself, what's my outcome? Or what's my ideal outcome? If you're uh, going to go hang out with the guys and you're going to play board games, you know, your outcome could be just to have a good time. But if you know yourself from the out, or if you know your outcome from the onset, you're significantly more likely to actually achieve that outcome. And especially if you visualize it, and then if you ask yourself, what do you hope to achieve? Uh, you're going to put yourself in a much better situation to actually have those particular events come true the way that you want it to. So your brain is like Google. We have access to this incredible search engine, you know, on our computers, on our smartphones, our tablets, that can answer virtually any question we ask it. But the problem is some of the answers that it gives us aren't always right based on the question that you ask. And your brain is similar. So if you ask your brain certain questions that aren't necessarily empowering, you're not going to get a good answer. Uh, so for the individuals that I work with that have trouble getting in shape, have trouble losing weight, uh, one question that they might consciously or subconsciously ask themselves is, why can't I get my stuff together? <laughs> uh, stuff, for lack of a better word. You know, why do I keep eating donuts? You know, why can't I blank? And if you ask yourself some of those why questions that are phrased in a disempowering way, you're going to get a negative answer. Your brain is going to search Google and it's going to come back and say something like, well, you can't get it together because you're a knucklehead, because you're a turkey, because you're a loser. And the objective truth of those questions isn't so important so much as the emotional reaction we have to those answers, because... The emotions that we feel, again, everything we want in life is an emotion, are going to determine our willingness to go for it. And if you keep asking yourself a question like, why can't I stick to my diet? And then the answer that comes back in your gut or in your head is, well, because I'm a loser, I just, I can't get my SHIT together. You're not going to be too highly motivated to really keep going. So what you need to do is you need to ask yourself a better question. How can I stick to my diet and make it more enjoyable? And when you ask yourself a better question like that, you're going to get a better answer because your brain searches for more empowering pathways. Again, all we want is emotions in life. We want to feel good. You know, we have plenty of opportunity to use that stick, to use that pain. But if in your gut level reaction, all you're, you're experiencing is pain, you're going to want to get away from it. So what's a better question? Why can't I stick to my diet? Or... How can I stick to my diet and make it enjoyable? Two very, very, very different questions, but your perception and your attitude in any given point in time is going to drastically determine how you act in a given situation. If you go to a bar with your guys, right, and uh, you know that you'd like to meet somebody, um, and the whole time you're at the bar, you're just thinking, man, I'm, I'm never going to meet somebody. I'm never going to meet somebody. How likely are you to really go approach some girl? And if you, uh, on the other end, if you go to the bar with the guys and you say, man, you know what? I'm going to go out and I'm going to have a great time tonight and I'm going to get three different phone numbers. Uh, that, again, that may not be objectively true, but that's going to make you more bold. That's going to make you more confident. And that's going to make you much more likely to actually have uh, some of those situations happen by the end of the night. Your attitude is everything in life. Your, your momentary attitude and your long-term happiness is all that matters. You know in your gut as a man that you will never compromise certain things. Again, uh, that hypothetical individual from earlier in this podcast will always find a way to put food on the table and to put a roof over the head of his wife and his daughter. Uh, 
So what we need to do as people is not work up these extreme hypothetical situations in our head that, like, hypothetically, that same guy, if I quit my grocery store job, you know, my wife and daughter aren't going to eat. He knows in his gut he will find a way. He will do whatever it takes to make that happen. What that hypothetical individual needs to do is ask himself instead, um, how can I actively work towards my dreams without compromising time with my family and actively work towards your dreams well you first have to know what they are you know what do you want your life to be about and that's a question that i asked on the first podcast that i did and who do you want to be as a man and what ultimate meaning do you want your life to have so at the end of the night because we're not done with that whiteboard right before bed so you brush your teeth you know you take your contact lenses out you shower whatever Um, right before you go in your room, turn off the lights and go to sleep, go back to your whiteboard and on a different part of it, write down a couple more questions. Number one, what was awesome about today? Number two, what wasn't good enough yet? And that question is worded very specifically. Again, if you ask yourself what sucked about today, you're going to come up with a negative answer and you're not going to feel too good. But if you say what wasn't good enough yet, first it acknowledges that something isn't perfect and needs to be worked on. But then if you, by saying good enough yet, you're also acknowledging the possibility that it can and will get better provided you consistently work at it. And then the last thing you need to ask yourself are what are three things that I have to get done tomorrow? And these will likely be the three things that when you wake up the next morning and you go back to your whiteboard, those will be the three things that you focus on. Your happiness is all that matters in life because it's all that you really have. It's the bullseye of our lives is defining our own happiness as men. And then the constant unerring, relentless pursuit of that happiness is what makes life worth living. If things are handed to us, we tend to take them for granted. You know, in life, uh, it's really true. The more you pay, the more you do pay attention. So as a man, you first have to define what makes you happy You know, what do you want your life to be about? Who do you want to be as a man? And then how can you go about achieving that? Keep the 80-20 rule in mind. Go to that whiteboard every single morning. What am I happy about? What am I grateful for? What do I love about myself and my life more than yesterday? Know certain planned activities, excuse me, that you have for that day and know your outcome. You know, what would you like to accomplish with that particular thing that you have to do that day? Visualize it. Remember, your brain is like Google. Ask it good questions. At the end of the night, review your whiteboard and say what was awesome about today, what wasn't good enough yet, and what are three things that you have to do tomorrow. Knowing that this life is brief, knowing that our time is limited, knowing that our heartbeats are limited, our moments that we have with loved ones are limited, make the most out of every moment in life. Don't take anything for granted. Always assume the best. Always uh, expect the best. And hold yourself to a higher standard than you hold anybody else to. Any interaction you have with another human being may be your last with them, and it might be your last on earth. So uh, don't squander away that opportunity to really be loving and insightful and inspiring to another human being. Thanks for listening today, guys. I hope this has been informative, and I will talk to you tomorrow.